So this research is being done at Concordia, okay, and uh, it's in collaboration with my colleagues at George Mason University in the U.S. and also NIST. So my plan is basically the, to have this research uh, uh, kind of realized in the real world systems uh, through my colleagues at George Mason because they have built a tool that is currently being used at places like uh, DOD and IFAA. And they are actually, they are trying to incorporate this research result. And then uh, we also wish to have some uh, impact on the uh, standardization effort on secondary metric, and that is through my colleague at NIST. Okay, so I have divided my talk into uh, basically three parts. And the first, I will talk about some uh, basic concept of secondary metric at a relatively high level without going too much technical details. And then I will jump into this uh, specific K0 day safety model that was recently uh, was presented at uh, the European uh, Symposium on, se on Security uh, last year. So I will talk a little bit uh, more technical details about this model. And then I will touch briefly on the application of how those, those metrics can be used. And then I will draw, con draw, draw, draw conclusions and give some future work. So first, in, uh, I will talk uh, at a very high level about uh, the motivation and the basic concepts. So why do we need the security metric? Say we have, s we, we have metric for temperature, we have metric for length and weight and so on. So why do we need a metric for, s for information security? So, you can, uh, so we can all imagine that this uh, small dialogue uh, that is probably currently happening in many uh, organizations. So a security expert, a security administrator is trying to convince his boss to buy some new security product. And the argument would be uh, such as this. So it will make our network much more secure. And of course, uh, this product is cutting edge, it's state of art, it's very, very good, right? But the, the boss is a, is a man of numbers. He's a man of more precision. And he knows that he's spending like $50,000. He wants something more precise. So he asks th this question, well, it's not good enough to know it will make our network much more secure. I want to know exactly how much more secure. And to that question, this security administrator has no answer. Okay? And he has no answer because we, as a security researchers, we don't have a good answer. Okay? So from this uh, small instant, we can, what we can learn is uh, this, uh, there's a famous thing saying, uh, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. And that is quite true. So you want to improve the security. You want to install firewall to make your network more, more, more secure. But any security solution has a cost. And to justify that cost, we need to know how much more secure that solution can make our network. Okay? And you can have some indirect measures. You can tell your boss, OK, this firewall has a very high, uh, it has a very low false positive rate, very low uh, false negative rate, right? So you can, you can have some, uh, in, some kind of indirect measurement, and you can also tell your boss, okay, that's, uh, you know, uh, you don't need to ask me why this, uh, we should buy this product. It's based on my 30 years of experience, right? So if I say we should buy, you, you should buy, okay? So, but this is more like an art. If you look at an uh, art gallery on the first, first, first floor of this building, right? Some of the work you may just feel it's beautiful. Although you cannot really explain why, it, why, it, why, why, why you think it's beautiful, but you know it is beautiful. But in network security, what we want is really something more like a sense. We want to uh, be able to claim why this solution will make our network secure and how much more secure it will, it will make the network. Instead of just saying, okay, uh, I feel it will make us more, more secure. Okay, so that's um, why we need this security metric. And w if we have this kind of security metric, then what we can do is when, the, when our boss asks the same question, how much more secure can you make our network? What we can give him is just a small table. 
right? We can see that if you want two units of security, two additional uh, units of security, and w whatever that unit might be, that will cost you 5K. If you want to increase it to three units, you need to spend 5K more. So you make the choice, right? So if we can do that, then we can see that more likely the boss will be willing to give us the money. So the next question is, once we know that we, we, we actually need security metrics, the next question is, can we actually do it? So, we, so in this work, we look at vulnerability aspect of security. Okay? So I know there are other aspects of security that you may need to matter, but in this particular work, we only look at vulnerability aspect. So there already exists standard for measuring the individual vulnerabilities. Okay. You can actually use, for example, the CVSS by NIST. This is, a st this is already a, a standard in its version 2. You can use CVSS to measure the exploitability, such as uh, uh, what kind of access do you need to exploit a vulnerability? Do you need to, be, to have a local account, and or you can just exploit it through the, uh, through the net, uh, network? And how hard it is. And then do, uh, how many instances of authentication do you need? Do you need just one, uh, one, one, one authentication for the both OS and application, or you, or you need more, more than that? And, uh, and also it, it can measure the impact of this individual, this particular uh, vulnerability. So what kind of an impact you have in terms of confidentiality, integrity, availability, and so on. And they also have the measures for uh, temporal factors, such as, uh, is there a patch? Uh, is there uh, already a widely available exploit code? And you can also, the, um, they will also allow you to measure the environmental factors, such as uh, what, is, uh, what is the exact impact in this particular context, in this particular network. You can combine those scores using the formula they have provided. Then you will reach one single score for each vulnerability, which will, will basically allow you to compare. You can pick two vulnerabilities, you can see this one is more severe than the other because it has a higher score, okay? So the first question that we ask is, since we have those measures of individual vulnerabilities, how can we combine them? How can we compose them to know the overall, to get a sense of the overall security of a network? I don't want to look at 10 hundred, uh, say 10 or 100 individual measures. I want to just get one single score for my network. And I want to know that if I make a small change at a firewall, can I get a lower score, which means it will, I will make my network more secure. So there are some straightforward ways for doing this. You can uh, just base it on the number of, uh, of vulnerabilities. You can see that well, the more vulnerability you have, appar apparently you are less secure. But that is a bad solution, apparently, because what if you have 100 vulnerabilities, okay? Or you say you have only one. You have only one vulnerability, but that vulnerability is good enough. It is enough for the attacker to reach his goal. Or in another network, you have, one, you have, one, you have much more. You have, one, you have 100 different vulnerabilities, but none of them will lead the attacker to the goal. Right, so, so I see the number is not really the key. You can also base it on the attacker's least effort. Okay, the easiest way to reach a goal. You use that as an indicator. But the problem is what if there exist many such easy ways? So in one network you have one such easy way. In another word, uh, network you have 100, 100 ways. Then, uh, then very clearly the second network is much less secure. And also we have the common uh, belief that more diversity, with more diversity, you are more secure. Well, this is not always true because more diversity will also actually allow, will also give the, uh, give the attacker more chance to succeed. So what we did is uh, we proposed to combine the scores of individual vulnerabilities using a well-known concept called attack graph. Okay, so what we do is we take the network configuration, 
Uh, we run the security scanners. We get um, all the collection of existing vulnerabilities. Then we compose them into a, a, a attack graph based on their, re their relationships. Okay, so this, <coughs> this will be a small example of attack graphs. And then what we do is we go to CVSS, we get the scores for each individual, vulner each individual vulnerability before we, we start to combine them. Then we have investigated ways of combining scores used uh, by treating them as probabilities. So what we do is we convert the CVSS scores into probabilities, which are, which are shown inside each uh, oval. We have a uh, probability there. Then we combine them just like probabilities. Okay? We combine them using those rules. Then we can get eventually one probability for the goal, goal uh, state, which means which shows that the attacker has 0 0.087 probability of reaching the goal. We also investigate the ways of uh, combining such scores using base network. And so we, what we do is uh, we regard the attack graph as a basic network. We derive formulas, tables to reach, uh, to calculate the probability for reaching the goal. And the one advantage of this approach of, approach of using basic network is that we can take care of the relationship such as this. If you assume that A and B are exploits of the same vulnerability, then by exploiting one of them, it will make the attacker's job much easier to exploit the second because they are they are the exact same manner basis. So the attacker has ex experience and the tools. So you can take that into consideration by assigning a higher conditional probability in the table. Okay, that's what we <coughs> do. Then we can we also investigate using the uh, the, de the DBN, the dynamic based network. And what we can do here is something si uh, similar to uh, uh, something similar to weather forecasting. So we can do security forecasting. We can, based on the current state of our network, we can predict what is the chance of an attack for tomorrow. Okay. So that's a very, I mean, each work is a separate master thesis. So I don't want to go into the, all those details. And this last work, uh, what we did is we don't combine the actual CVSS score. We actually dig more, we dig deeper into the base matrix that CVS has used to derive those scores. And the, uh, the, 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 mo the, the, the most important advantage of doing so is that we can handle the vulnerability dependency with more semantics. Just one small example here that, uh, so in order to reach uh, vulnerability D, it says that you need a local account on this network. Now, if you exploit uh, the vulnerability B, which you can exploit from the internet, this exploit B will give you that local account. Okay? So we can say that by exploiting uh, vulnerability B first, it makes your job of exploiting D much easier. Okay? So we, take, we, 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 can, we can handle this kind of dependency between different vulnerabilities using this technique, which is much more semantics than the uh, previous technique. And this work, by the way, this work is done by a master student uh, sitting there, Peng Su, and he's looking for a job, so if you have any <laughs> Positions, please talk to him. Okay, so okay, so so far so good. Those are the work that we have done for uh, taking measurement of known vulnerabilities. Okay, so the for the for those vulnerabilities that we can scan, we can find uh, with those and uh, security security scanners, and for which we have good knowledge. Okay, if you look at if you look at the national vulnerability data, uh, database. They have a very detailed description of the preconditions, postcondition, and so on. Okay. But what about the unknowns? What about the zero-day attacks? How we can measure them? Okay. And the, the, there's a famous paper by John McHugh, uh, who actually used to be in Canada, you know, move, uh, has moved to uh, states. And he claimed that if you talk about measuring unknown vulnerabilities, you are talking about measuring the unmeasurable. Okay. So because there is not much ground for you to make such a measurement. Because it's unknown vulnerability, that means you don't know anything about it. So you cannot base a measurement based on your knowledge. There's no such knowledge. You cannot base it on your knowledge about the, un the underlying software. Because the software flaws are much more less predictable than hardware faults. 
Okay, there's a fault tolerance uh, discipline uh, about hardwares, but for software flaws, the quality of softwares, it's not that easy. Okay. And it cannot be based on the attacker's behavior. Okay, you cannot rely on your study of the attacker's behavior trends uh, in finding flaws or developing it through, because that is believed to be a very chaotic process. Okay, so you basically, you don't have any ground to make such a measurement. Okay, then, then what? So what? If we cannot measure the unknown vulnerability, so what? Is it really a big deal? Well, John McHugh also said that if you cannot measure the unknowns, then it doesn't make any sense to, make, to measure the knowns. Okay? You can measure all the known vulnerabilities, but the attacker can always simply stamp outside and do as he please. Okay? Then there's really not much value of doing all those work on security metric because you know that those attackers can always just get, get around what you have done. Okay? So the so basically, we have reached a dead end. We, there's not much we can do in terms of security metric if you cannot measure the unknown vulnerabilities. Okay. <coughs> so what we did is we look at this situation again. Then we ask, us, we ask ourselves a, a, a different question. We said, not what if we can't measure unknown vulnerabilities. What if we don't measure them? Since we cannot, then we just we just admit this, and we, we, then we move on, we say we don't measure. What if you don't measure the unknown vulnerabilities? Well, that means you can count them. Because if you don't measure their relative sever severity, that means you are regarding them as equally likely. You are regarding them as equally, uh, as equally severe. And then you can start counting them. Okay? Because then what is really important is how many such unknown vulnerabilities your network can resist, or how many such vulnerabilities that will allow an attacker to reach his goal. Okay? And later we will see that if you, be, you have some belief that you can actually distinguish between different unknown vulnerabilities, you can see this one is a little bit more likely than the other one. You can actually assign a weight to them. It's not very hard to, de to, de to uh, actually handle it. So, but here we just take a very simplified approach. We say that a larger such count will mean a more secure network, simply because in order to reach his goal, the attacker will need to have more unknown, to have more uh, zero-day attack available at the same time, applicable to this particular network, and also exploitable by the same attacker. And that likelihood is, of course, much lower. If you can regard all the unknown vulnerabilities as a IID, as a, you know, as an independent event, then this likelihood, you can see, it's, it, will decrease ex, 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 it will decrease exponentially. But we don't really need such a statistical model. We can just safely claim that this likelihood will be lower. So we have found a new way. We have found a new way to handle the unknowns. So in the summary, uh, our contribution in this work is um, we have formally defined this model. We prove it to be a metric because uh, in order to, to be a metric, you need to satisfy certain algebraic properties. We uh, propose the algorithms and we study the applications. Okay? And what is important is, is that this is the first effort to our best knowledge. This is the first effort that can handle the risk of uh, unknown, unknown attacks. Okay? So this is a this is a high-level summary of what we have done. And next, I will, I will go into uh, a little bit more details about this model and uh, before we talk about this application. So I will not talk about the formal model here, just to go through this small, small example. And so we have a small, uh, very tiny network uh, that composed of an internal network with two hosts, just two hosts, and behind the firewall, and the attacker is on host outside. So we well, so our model of and our, our and our model include of course the host, the uh, services running on, on each host, the connectivities, okay, and the, the relationship between those services. So now if, let's think about this uh, uh, question here. With this tiny network, 
if we can assume that all those services running on each host are free of any known vulnerabilities, okay, we have run the scanning and we found nothing. It's absolutely secure. Each host is absolutely secure. Okay. Then, if we ask the question, can the attacker reach this host? Can the attacker take over this host too? Then, if you ask the, for example, the existing tool, so if you ask a vulnerability scanner, if you ask an IDS, if you ask a graph, they will all tell you no, the attacker cannot because there is no vulnerability. Then if you ask questions, then do we need some additional security measures such as these IP tables? Do we need to enforce, to write some, I, some IP table rules there? Is it really useful? Then all those existing tools will tell you, no, not really. We, d we don't need something additional. It's already perfectly secure. Okay. But now if we ask the question in a different way, if, you, if, if we consider at least how many zero-day attacks are required to compromise this network. At least how many zero-day attacks are required to, for the attacker to, kick, to take control of this host tool, then we will reach a very different conclusion. Okay, so we make some assumptions about the so-called zero-day vulnerability, and it's quite reasonable uh, assumptions. It basically says that if you cannot, if the, net, if the hosts are not even physically connected, then you cannot exploit the other host. If you cannot use your own host, you cannot exploit the other host. And if there's no services running on the other host, then you cannot exploit it. Okay, so then what we, we can do is uh, we can establish something called a zero-day attack graph based on this network configuration and based on our assumptions that we have made here. And this, that this zero-day attack graph has a zero-day exploit it has a pre and post conditions of each exploit. And now what we can do is, what we can do is we can then analyze, okay, we make some assumptions. And then what we can do is we can analyze on each possible path, okay, that attacker can follow zero day attacks to reach his goal. How many different zero day attacks will be necessary? If you look at this pass, it says that the attacker can potentially exploit some zero-day attack on this secure shell service on host one, and then exploit the same zero-day attack on the secure shell service on host two. So you will only need one zero-day attack in order to exploit both at both the uh, host yeah, and to take to take over this host two. Okay? And if you look at some other parts, for example, this pass you will need two different zero-day attacks. You have to somehow take control of this firewall, either through the default password or some other, uh, some other zero-day zero 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 attacks. So, and you have, to take, so you have to take control of the firewall and change its, conf change its, conf this, its uh, configuration such that it will allow you to access host two, because currently this firewall doesn't allow external requests to the host two. So you, you, so you modify the firewall so that, so that you can access host two, then you explore the same uh, vulnerability on the secure shell service on host two in order to take control of it. Okay. So along this path, you will need two different zero-day attacks. Okay. And that says that this path is much easier. It is the easiest way to, to take control of this host two. So we have this metric saying that by following this path, you will need only one. So the number is one. Okay, so for this net, so for this network, at least one zero-day vulnerability is required to compromise, to come to reach a goal, to to take control of this host. Now, if we make a small change, if we write a, 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 some kind of IP table rules to prevent any external access to this secure shell service on host one, then things will change. It will change to this. That which we, uh, where we can say that now with this IP table rules, you will need at least two, di two different zero day, uh, two, di two different zero day vulnerabilities in order to reach the same goal. Because here, by, there, by following the same path, you will have to compromise the IP tables first, and then you can, you can compromise the sec uh, secure shell service. Okay. 
Okay. So we have increased the number, we have increased this k from one to two. So we have a larger k and that says we are more secure, we are more likely. So in summary, this metric can help us to compare the relative <coughs> security of different configurations that are both secure deemed by existing tools. So if you ask any existing tools, they will tell you, well, they are both secure. There is, no mu there is not much di uh, difference. But with this metric, we can actually point to this number and say this additional security measure actually makes us more secure. And of course, though we are talking about a very simplified uh, model, a very simplified example. There are, much, uh, there are many more features of the model there that are covered in the paper. So we have studied algorithms for calculating the value of k. Uh, I don't want to go through it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, this, uh, this problem is proved uh, to be very uh, hard. Uh, it's a very hard problem. And we also investigate the uh, variation of this problem, uh, saying that we don't want to calculate the, the exact value of k. We just want to know if k is bigger than a certain small number, for example, one or two. Okay. And that can be done in polynomial time. So that is a... Uh, that is the talk about the model. Now I will go to the application of the metric. So if you look at the formal model, if you look, look at the paper that it gives you the formal model, we can actually unfold the k, this single number k we want. We can unfold it, we can derive it using these formulas. And of course we don't want to go through those uh, formulas, but what this formula tells us, what is important is what it tells us. It tells us that this number k, this indicator of the security, it can be increased. You can make your network more secure by doing those things. For example, you can increase the diversity of the surfaces. That will basically <coughs> enable the more vulnerabilities here to, set, to satisfy this equation. So it, this set, will, this, the size of this set will increase. So this number will increase, this number will increase. So eventually you will have a larger k. Okay. So by looking at this, by looking at this formula, you can <coughs> claim that your network can be more secure by implementing those hardening options. You can uh, strengthen the isolation. You can remove those things that you don't need. Okay. You can use backups, IDS, and so on. All those will increase the k. Okay. But I'm sure that to most people here, those are not really new. There is nothing new. Right? Those hardening options are something that you are quite familiar with, although maybe they are under different names, okay? but they are really nothing new. But this is actually a good news for us because it actually shows that our metric is quite relevant. It's really, it really closely reflects the, the currently existing industry practice. Okay? And what is important is the, I mean, our metric doesn't, that doesn't give you any new hardening options. What it gives you is it will allow you to quantify such options. You can now tell your boss that by increasing the diversity of those surfaces, okay, by replacing the, all those windows with Unix and Mac and so on, you can actually increase the K by, for example, the value of one. You can increase it from two to three. And for that, you need to spend five K more. So are you willing to do it? Okay, so this becomes a very simple question, and it's so simple that even the boss can understand, hopefully. So just to remind you that this is, a, of course, a res uh, I, uh, academia research, and it's a research on paper. So what we have done is uh, we focus on the algorithms and models. Okay? So we, uh, we define the form of the abstract model. We gave you an algorithm to calculate the k and to, uh, to tell you what the, what does the k mean? But how you can actually instantiate this abstract model from a given real world network, that is outside scope of, of this work. Okay? And admittedly, that could be the harder part of the question. Right? But we don't really deal with this in this work. OK, so as a conclusion, we have proposed, uh, we have done research here at Concordia uh, on the different ways for measuring the both the, uh, uh, for measuring the both the known and unknown vulnerabilities, and you, you can see clearly there are much more to be done than what 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 has been done. 
So the, there are many, many uh, open issues, uh, <coughs> such as how do you can unify the metrics for both unknown and the knowns, and how you can use something more meaningful. I, so instead of the probabilities or just the numerical score, for example, we can use time, we can use the mean time to compromise as a measure. And we can, um, take it, we can consider the other aspects in addition to vulnerability. And, uh, and, uh, and also one of the most challenging issues is how do you evaluate the metrics? I mean, we are incorporating those metrics in the real world tool and begin to evaluate, but how do you evaluate in lab? Okay. Then how, how do you apply the um, metrics? So what can you apply the metrics to in addition to this uh, Edward Harding? So all those are open problems. So this is a, so in fact, this is a very new, very new area. Uh, there's not much uh, work done, and we are among the first uh, uh, people that are working on it, but I believe this is a very important area. <coughs> okay, so that's all. I will take some uh, questions. Yes. My question is about uh, the relation between K, the level, and the security okay. level, okay. and the cost of the, uh, the security. Okay. Uh, I hope you need uh, more indicator, more business indicator, to uh, build this re relation. Okay. Um, well, currently, what we do is uh, we take into consideration the value of the asset. For example, the you are worried about is host two. We are worried about the attacker taking over the host tools. You can ascend this uh, host to uh, an asset value. You can say it will cost me one million dollars if I lose it. Okay. Right? So and you can, uh, for example, ascend uh, one hundred dollars to host one. So that means I don't really care, right? But uh, for what you have mentioned, we don't. This model doesn't really consider it. But I think that's a good thing to, to okay. add. The, the evaluation of assets. Do you have any method to I to evaluate to evaluate the assets? No, we, we just uh, leave this uh, asset value as a, as, a, uh, as, a user, as a user input. We don't, uh, as, as I said, I mean, the, the practical part of the problem, uh, how do you instantiate from the network, that's the uh, way they didn't cover it in this work. Okay, thank, thank you. Yes. You mentioned the cost, and based on my experience, uh, because of the cost, many systems are not state of the art in a company. Okay. And because of this, uh, your systems uh, tends to be uh, K zero day attack. That the system are state of the art. Are you also considering uh, all the system that are not on the actual uh, state with this uh, system that you are mentioning here? Uh, I don't. I don't understand. The, for example, the it's state of art. Oh, it's old. It's, it's okay. Not let's say the art. firewall. The you have a firewall that's ten okay. years old. And oh, I see. Okay. Well, I, okay, as I said, okay, as I said, in this work, we take very simplified approach. We say all zero-day attacks are equally likely. But if in the case, for example, in this case, we have a cutting edge, we have a very new cutting edge, uh, brand new, uh, very, very advanced firewall. We have very, ten, very old, 10 years old firewall. So uh, of course you will believe, right? Although it's not always true, but you will believe at least old firewall is more, vun is more vulnerable to zero day, to zero, zero day, zero day attacks. So in that case, you can ascend the weight. You don't have to take them as equally. Like you, you can ascend the weight, you can see this one counts for 0 0.5. That one counts for one. Okay. You can do that, you can, that, I mean, it's not very hard to incorporate that into this model, but the hard is, of course, what is hard is how do you determine what value to, what weight to ascend to? And, and also, I, 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 I mean, you can argue, even it's old feral, it doesn't mean it's, it's, it really, it's always more vulnerable than, than the new one. It's not, it's not true, right? Uh, for example, the, the German cars, the BMW, Benz, they are, they are not really that reliable because they have too many new, te new technologies in them, right? So it's not, you, it's something uh, you can argue. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, my question is the following: uh, the matrix is designed to me measure the, the 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 zero day uh, mm -hmm. the the zero day vulnerabilities on each host or on uh, on the glo on the global. No, no, system. no. It's uh, to the it's to measure the it's to measure the overall impact of all the potential zero day attacks. Okay, so there is a, a combination of the different. Yes, of course. Uh, of course. I mean, you have to look at the different paths. You basically, you get a path that gives you the least uh, k. Okay. And you use that as a and and how you ponder this uh, different metrics for different hosts, the p ponderation, the weight, how you, uh, for example, for a host uh, you give them a metric X, and for another host you have. Yeah, as I said, we 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 don't do that. We okay. take all the zero day attacks as equally likely, okay. uh, based on the the fact that we don't we know nothing about it. It's and a summation. And in the case you know something about it, yeah. you can ascend weight. Okay. But I mean, uh, the hard part is how to ascend weight. That, yeah. that is Maybe uh, by uh, by considering the damage that can be uh, the cost of the attack if uh, if the attack. Oh, we we actually you know? do that separately. Okay. We take the set value as uh, an, an additional. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Okay. Question. Okay. Let's thank again. Uh, thank you.